this general area, both uh, in terms of Estonia's remarkable development and now an international um, dimension. Um, I won't, won't go into great detail about his career, except to say that it's an interesting one which began in Europe, brought him to New Jersey at a relatively early age where he grew up, uh, went to Columbia, uh, graduate study at the University of Pennsylvania, um, then back to Europe where he was a division chief at Radio Free Europe with special responsibilities for Eastern Europe, um, managed to get into Estonia after some effort before the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, then began working very closely with the Estonian government. Uh, at a particular moment in time, was asked to become a candidate for the presidency, and he did better than I did. He got elected <laughs> and, uh, and served for two full terms as the president of Estonia and has had a great deal, has had a great deal to do uh, not only with, with the remarkable development of this tiny country in this field, but uh, now uh, increasingly as uh, a leader in international efforts to deal with this thing we're, we're, we're working on. And um, so it's just a, a great honor for us to uh, recognize him uh, this year as our uh, world leader in cybersecurity uh, and ask him to speak to us, and then we're going to have a good roundtable discussion, I hope, with him before we uh, wrap up this morning. President Nils. And we have a plaque for him. Oh. Great. And we have a plaque for him as well. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of your good work. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank I think you I think you can accept you can, that. Uh, you can sit here and stand here and uh, take the picture. Picture time. Yeah. Okay. Where is it? Okay. Where are the cameras? Well, thank you very much. Uh, before I start off, actually, I start off with a two-finger comment on Joe Nye, uh, which is that just that uh, the there's an article in Politico last week about the Russians making an offer to the U.S. on a bilateral treaty, which the U.S. rejected. Uh, of course, I mean, as a European, I would say, yeah, uh, of course, the Russians who have clearly me <coughs> meddled in Germany, U.K., Spain, Italy, World Agency, uh, World Anti-Doping Agency, that it doesn't really encourage us if there's a bilateral treaty and we're left out to continue manipulation. But basically the U.S. rejected it because it is kind of asymmetric because if the, uh, you already know the result of the election, so, I mean, <laughs> what's meddling going to do? Anyway, to get to my talk, um, I'm gonna start talking about security sort of uh, from a ground up level because I actually think that um, I'll expand upon that security uh, has at least in all post enlightenment uh, democracies based its approach on sort of Locke's model that the individual gives up his right uh, Hobbesian right to kill someone else to the state in return for uh, for security, be it your local police, your national security agencies, or internationally in the army. Uh, and that um, what we have done uh, in Estonia is actually put the state at the center of the security. At the same time, just lest you think we're kind of dirigist, uh, a dirigist European government, we're probably far less intrusive mm -hmm. in people's lives than uh, the, in the United States. But more broadly, I think is that we have to rethink uh, most aspects of our lives in, ret in looking at living in the digital age. I mean, basically, ever since William Gibson in his uh, dystopian novel Necromancer took Norbert Wiener's uh, term cybernetic and popularized the prefix cyber, 
Uh, this, this prefix has proliferated to almost all spheres of human activity, which I think is an indication of how much uh, the, sort of the digital world has permeated our lives. So we have cyberpunk, cybercrime, cyber hygiene, cyberspace, cyber Pearl Harbor, cyber war, cybersecurity, and of course, inevitably, cyber sex. Um, rather than bemoan, uh, as some have the ubiquitous use of the prefix, um, saying it's meaningless, I actually welcome the ubiquity uh, to emphasize how profoundly our lives have, uh, in our societies, our nations, indeed almost all human endeavor has come to be dependent upon digital communication. Uh, so basically, are we dealing with the privacy of emails or, or our electoral democracy uh, to, to our infrastructure, um, ride and apartment sharing, the integrity of our financial system, banking, the ads that we see on social media in, um, in, during electoral campaigns. Uh, all of these are subject to manipulation and attack. Uh, all of these, with the exception of social media and the sharing economy, also existed before the digital era. But they now have all been altered by the uh, free movement of electrons. And are in completely different form, which requires us to rethink much of how we do things in all other aspects and realms of human activity. Um, and this is, of course, all due to the, the, uh, the increasing power of the silicon chip, also known as Moore's Law, which doubles every year and a half, even if it's slowing down a bit, um, because we are pushing the limits of physics. But Basically, the world is nonetheless completely different from the way it was 25 years ago. Um, and while the digital, all things digital, have changed beyond belief, um, governments, policies, laws, regulations actually have failed to keep up with this. And of course, okay, when we talk about what can the government do on cybersecurity, whichever government it is, that's very good. But on the other hand, we actually have not looked at all the rest of life. Uh, I mean, when we have events such as the uh, you know, 145 million adults in the United States had their, all of their financial records stolen. I mean, that's probably 80% of the adult population. It is completely untouched by government regulation, except for the fact, probably, from sort of old-style rules that the uh, management sold their stocks uh, before informing the population that their data had been stolen. But we have, you know, we have, to, we have to come to terms that it's a much broader issue. And, um, and I guess most importantly, if we look at it, is that the, at the core of our digital security, and I'm not talking about the government and the NSA and our, uh, and our uh, sort of electrical infrastructure, but basically what we do online, all of us, um, started out 35 years ago uh, with a system uh, that worked fine then when there were about 3,500 academics using a network called BitNet, where security relied on an email address, almost always ending uh, with a top-level uh, domain of .edu, um, and these people generally did not pose a security or a criminal threat. Yet today, there are 4.2 billion people online. We fear all of these things, cyber war, cyber crime, doxed emails. But basically, what we're dealing with is that since we use BitNet, we've had 22 or 23 iterations of Moore's Law, um, which means that today, computers are 8.4 million times more powerful than they were when we started using this system among 3,500 academics. And we also, uh, so we have an increase of an, uh, roughly the same order of magnitude from 3.5 from 3 thousand people using BitNet to 3.5 to 4.2, depending who you ask, billion people online. Um, we've been very slow to realize this. As Joe Nye pointed out in an article six years ago, um, immediately after the Munich Security Conference, without naming me, he quoted me, I said, this is the first time the Munich Security Conference 
has ever dealt with the issue of cybersecurity. That was 2011. Up till 2011, the Munich Security Conference, the premier conference on security of the world, had not even, had not, did not have a single panel on the issue of cybersecurity. Now, of course, the Munich Security Conference has an entire separate conference on cybersecurity, but that that's just shows how, that, how recently this was not considered an issue. Um, now, what I'll try to do today is try to look at cybersecurity kind of at three levels, beginning with the individual, and then moving on to the state, and then finally getting to, to the sort of international level. Um, and again, to reiterate, my point of view is that security has been uh, the responsibility of the state pre-digital, and it remains so today, but the state has failed to keep up uh, in general in most places, and that this does remain a key, uh, key aspect of the Lockean social contract, uh, where we do give up certain amount, certain rights uh, in exchange for protection uh, against sort of Hobbesian uh, a war of all against all uh, war. Um, but this also, while well, we've sort of gotten there with in the, sort of in the analog or physical world, we are very slow to get there in the digital world. And ultimately, I would argue that security is a political choice based on policies, laws, and deriving from those laws, regulations. Uh, and just as we have in the physical analog world, you know, civilian control of the military as a core concept in democracies, hobbyist corpus, laws regulating use of guns. Again, when we get to digital, we are we're fairly poor in this respect. So, um, when we come to cyber, when we come to sort of cyber, the cyber world, we I argue are too focused on the technology um, rather than the the policies, laws, and regulations. Um, and um, I say this especially now, knowing the system that we have created in Estonia, that actually the technology is not that advanced. But we are way ahead of everyone else when it comes to use of digital technology. And this is a function of the laws. Uh, I should mention here that just this week in the New Yorker, you will be able to read probably the best article I have ever read, and I think I've read every single English language article that has ever come out on my country and digitization, but the best article that has appeared just came out yesterday. It's in this week's New Yorker. It's written by a guy named Nathan Heller. Um, and I, that sort of describes the way everything works um, in a very nice way. So I don't even get into that. So basically, um, oh, and one thing I should add before I talk about what we do. There is a huge difference in this regard between what we do and I say most countries. Um, because our focus has been always on the gee whiz aspects of technology, which became clear to me when after 25 years of dealing with digitizing my country, and it was, uh, I mean, aside the fact that I was a geek once, but which was always tough going politically, I moved, to, I finally sort of finished my, my term. My dream came true. I was invited to Stanford to the mecca of innovation in IT. And of course, that's where everything is. In a 10 mile radius of my office, I have the headquarters of Apple, Google, Facebook, Tesla. I mean, it keeps going on and on and on. Uh, I guess only Microsoft is really missing. Um, and on top of that, three miles away from me is Sand Hill Road, which basically funds all of this enormous uh, innovation. Yet. When I went to register my daughter to go to school, I had to bring an electricity bill to prove that I lived there. And then when she, uh, after she had, uh, she had to take an ESL exam because she'd gone to school in Estonia, and she placed out of taking sort of a catch-up course, and she had to get permission, I had to give her permission to enter in a regular English class, so I had to sign two pieces of paper. I had to deliver one to the school, 
physically sign the paper. Another one, four miles away at the municipal school district headquarters. I got there, there was a line of about 20 people. And I said, well, I just have a piece of paper to drop off here. And the last person turned and said, we all just have a paper to drop off here, but they have to make a photocopy of it. And suddenly it struck me that, in fact, everything that I had been experiencing in that process, except for the photocopying, was identical to the 1950s. I mean, nothing had changed, except in the 1960s, you started getting photo Xerox machines in the US school system, so you could actually make a photocopy. Um, so I get you say that to illustrate where we are uh, in most countries when it comes to digitization. Uh, we took a different route. Um, I won't, by the way, mention what it's like to register a car. Um, usually it takes uh, one to two days, sometimes three. Uh, unless you buy a new car and then the dealership does it for you, which I had to finally end up doing. Um, but what we did in Estonia, just for background, I mean, why we did what we did was, I mean, we emerged out of the, the miasma of the Soviet Union in 1991, re-emerged because we had been independent. Um, in 1938, the last full year before the World War to uh, Estonia and our linguistic cousins across the bay to the Gulf it had the same GDP per capita. When we became independent again, the difference between GD in G GDP per capita between our two countries was 13-fold. And we were still basically operating with no infrastructure except for military infrastructure. All roads that were built during the Soviet period were for military purposes. And so looking at this awful situation, everyone, people came up with all kinds of plans. And um, what I proposed, since I'd been taught in a real fluke and serendi serendipitous uh, event, I learned to program at age 14, was I said, well, why don't we teach kids how to use computers? Which we start, embarked upon in 95, 96, by 97, 98, we had, uh, all schools were online. Um, schools had labs, which we opened to the public after school hours, so other people could learn to use computers. Keep in mind, everyone is poor, um, so they can't buy computers, but they do have access to them. And this, by this time, we sort of got in this sort of a thinking of, well, maybe digitization really is the way to go for the, for the country. But s we realized somewhere around uh, the late 90s that uh, we could do it differently because ultimately we were worried even then about security and what that meant. And, and we do have a neighbor next to us that's very big and probably very good at causing problems in the digital realm as the US has discovered later on. Um, so we thought long and hard about how to, what it is that we need to do. And one of the things we came to very quickly was the fundamental issue of cybersecurity for the population is identity. Who are you? I mean, we all know the, um, you know, the old New Yorker cartoon on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Well, it's actually the fundamental problem of cybersecurity is that if you, you don't know who you're talking to, you don't know, in fact, this is where it differs from what I'll talk about later on, the kinetic world of warfare, you don't even know if it's in your own country that you are talking to um, who you're talking to. Um, and so uh, what we realize is that we must start off with a strong digital identity and this is what one of the key axioms I would argue for any, for the future of digital security. Um, and so, of course, that sounds good theoretically. Uh, what that meant in policy terms was that in 2001, we offered everyone, everyone living in Estonia at that time, uh, citizens, permanent residents, a unique chip-based digital identity card that was um, where communication was ensured with two-factor authentication with end-to-end -end encryption. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, we, we did this because we realized e even then that the primary model of email address plus password is not gonna last for long 
And in fact, today, there is no password that can't be broken in the sort of email plus password paradigm through brute force hacking. <coughs> so uh, if you don't have two-factor authentication, you might as well give up. And this already means that on most tra transactions that you do in, or in life in most countries, uh, you can't be s sure of anything. Um, we did that at, um, I mean, in order to, uh, to do this, we, uh, we did this with a chip card plus a code, I mean, just for the people who are really interested in this. We see in many places today, two-factor authentication slowly coming in. Apple author uses it, Google uses it. The problem with two-factor authentication, the way it's done in most places, for example, at Stanford, that has become the norm because of a big hack several years ago. Uh, is that the S7 protocol, which, which is, governs the communication between uh, telephone, I mean, mobile phone communications, uh, has been hacked, is hackable, and in fact, the first case of a big hack was the loss of 3 million euros in a, by a German bank this spring that did use two-factor authentication using uh, a mobile phone second factor. So, uh, that was how we, uh, we started off. Um, we did this on a public-private uh, sort of partnership basis, because every, every interaction has to be authenticated, um, and the, authentic the, the verification or certification of each transaction is done by a 50-50 public-private partnership uh, between, uh, in a center that is half paid for by the government, half by a consortium of banks. Um, the, this, what we, I mean, the second step was that all this, um, that using a two-factor authentication with a highly encrypted public key infrastructure, meaning end-to-end -end, uh, encryption, meant that we could offer all people living in the country um, genuine security, uh, at least, I mean, starting from the premise that nothing is completely secure, at least far more secure than the kind of security that most people enjoy in most places. Uh, we have been using, uh, until, until we found out that, the, that Infineon produced a, uh, a flawed chip, uh, RSA 2048, we did a patch, or I mean, what, I guess, unlike most companies and most countries, we actually said we had a, a problem with, uh, with the uh, chip, um, and now we've gone over from RSA to uh, an elliptical encryption. Uh, I should say that other co countries that use the same chip, unfortunately, have not been very open about it. We were. Um, now, the key is that, uh, I mean, going back to, the, uh, to 2001, we did one more step, which is actually a key to make creating a functioning digital society in which, again, most places have not undertaken at all, which is that we gave the, the identity legal efficacy. That is, you can sign legal documents online with this system. That means hooking it up to a national registry. This causes howls of indignation from the Five Eyes countries, also or the Anglosphere, UK, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, who say, we will never have a digital identity, let alone any kind of legal efficacy. Which I always find kind of odd, because in fact, the United States, UK, Canada, et cetera, all offer passports in which the state says, you are you. All we're doing is saying, the state is saying you are you to enable legal transactions um, for, uh, digitally, as opposed to having it in a physical passport. Um, the use of our system, and here we have, I mean, the, the card, um, and here this is behavioral economics, is that we make it mandatory to have a card. You never have to use it, but you must have one. Why do we do that? Because uptake rates of digital identities in most countries 
or at, today in Europe, all countries must issue or offer digital identity, the uptake rates are 15 to 25 percent. Um, the early adopters are the ones who take out a card. We, uh, we decided we would make it mandatory because no services will develop either in the public sector where different ministries should be developing things or in the private sector which would have an interest in this unless they know that, well they won't do it if, you, if they think that 85% of the population can't even use this service. So, I mean, we have things such as digital prescriptions, which are used actually today by 99% of the population. You don't ever have a paper prescription. You call your doctor and he'll renew your prescription or your doctor writes it in when you go see him. Those things don't happen. You know, no one takes the effort to develop those kinds of systems unless, unless you have, uh, uh, the private sector and the public sector are sure that basically everyone can use this. Um, so these are the, this is sort of laying the groundwork for a digital society. Uh, and of course, what makes our bank transactions secure instead of uh, what I find here is that you do have, you, it is all card ba based, chip based, be it a f mobile phone or, a, uh, or your card. Uh, we don't have checks in, in uh, Estonia. Uh, in fact, I don't quite, I read recently how one system works here is that you can, you, we, we have electronic banking. So you, you go online, you do something, and then the bank prints a paper check and then mails it. This is not a digital society, I would argue. Um, skipping it, how much time do I have here still? No. Okay, I don't, I mean, I can go on and on. No. Oh, no, no, not so much. Anyway, I basically I'd argue that a state-guaranteed ID um, is, seems to be the main stumbling block uh, in most countries for a, for a secure digital society. Again, my argument is that this is simply something that in a democrat democratic society that is responsible for the security of its citizens, it must offer this. I mean, you, don't have to, you may not want to go the full step that we did, that you make it mandatory, but then you basically assume that digital services, at least on the part of the government, will not, um, will not take off. Uh, I just read last night a perfect example of why a democratic government that wants uh, input from its citizens needs a digital identity. In the ongoing debate on net neutrality, the FCC got over a million, I mean, it, like many federal agencies, it asked people's opinion. It got a million fake or bizarre, I mean, sort of un, non-existent comments um, against net neutrality. And I don't know how many got in favor of maintaining net neutrality, but unless you, I mean, unless you can log on and be you, as a citizen of the United States, commenting on impending regulations, then what's the point of asking anyone? In fact, uh, some, I guess, 400,000 of the comments came from Russia. I mean, this is not how you run a democracy, or at least this is not how you do open government soliciting opinions from your citizens. Uh, I mean, we have the same system in our country where you know, on various issues we ask people's opinion, but you have to do it by saying who you are. Uh, if you don't say who you are, there's no point. I mean, I don't want to get into issues of anonymity and, um, and how crucial that is or how crucial it may not be and how it may be a, ultimately a victim of our lo lack of cyber of security in the cyber realm. But nonetheless, I would say that, that without a secure identity, um, the functioning of a democracy um, becomes, I, I, I would maintain, um, stymied. Now, the second thing we did, uh, just to uh, just to talk about how we have uh, put security into the system is designing a, a very different architecture from what is usually used. Most countries or most governments uh, have used centralized databases. Uh, the OPM hack, uh, 15 million 
or 23 million U.S. federal government employees, including CIA, NSA personnel, including their personnel, personal, or their psychological profiles, were hacked, as you probably know, two years ago. Doesn't even matter who did it. Uh, the fact is that they had all of this stuff uh, easily accessible and in clear text. It wasn't even encrypted, um, which I would find, again, kind of unconscionable, uh, not to mention the, um, the kind of hack we saw with uh, Equifax. But what we, we realized quickly is that a, we could not have a centralized, uh, centralized central database uh, for purely economic reasons. In the late 90s, everyone was going after big central servers. You know, we being sort of where we were, we had, what we had done was that every ministry, every agency, every company had, all of, had its own servers, um, often using different systems, uh, but, and also with a great degree of uh, sort of, of um, I don't know, independence, but at least arrogance. Uh, they were little fiefdoms. And so in trying to figure this problem out, we had some mathematicians of ours came out with the distributed data exchange layer, which we call XROAD, uh, in which everything is connected to everything through the authentication uh, of your identity, uh, which basically the, uh, the idea is that if, um, if your identity gives you the wall and the moat, then uh, in most uh, of a castle, most systems, once you breach the moat and the wall, you're in and everything is open to you. In our system, uh, if you breach the moat and the wall, you're still stuck in a room, one room, one person. You can get, every, you can get something for that one person, but you can't get the rest of the citizenry. Um, to make it work, since it's, uh, hello, hi, can we put on that uh, video? It's just a three minute video just to give, uh, my throat a break and uh, a little commercial for you, for you, commercial break to show how our system works. There's sound too. Running a modern state is a data-centered endeavor. Ensuring the functioning of the state requires administering very large quantities of data. Estonia lacks a centralized or master database. Data is stored where it is created. Each agency administers its own data separately, and data is not duplicated. At the same time, state authorities and agencies need data outside their purviews in order to function. For example, the police constantly require information from the population register. Likewise, the unemployment insurance fund depends on information from the health information system. How can authorities securely exchange important data? First, the data must be easily accessible by the authorities that are authorized to use it. Second, the integrity of the data must be maintained. No third party should be able to make any changes to the data while it is in transit. Third, the data must remain confidential during its journey. It must be protected from the eyes of unauthorized parties. The X-Road is a data exchange platform that fulfills all three of these requirements. The X-Road makes life simpler for both the state and the citizens. For example, when a child is born, information about the birth is sent directly from the hospital to the population register. From there, it is sent automatically to the health insurance fund so that the child will have health insurance and a family physician. This prevents the creation of excessive paperwork and saves time. The state functions in the background. The X-Road helps authorities make work processes more convenient. Many activities can be automated, which frees employees to deal with matters that require human involvement. Authorities also don't have to worry about the authenticity of data. They can be confident that data received from the tax board definitely originated from the actual tax board. Additionally, the X-Road can be used regardless of what technology an authority uses. For the state, the X-Road, above all, makes it possible for authorities to efficiently exchange data among themselves. Sensitive information moves securely, and the system itself is so resilient that it cannot be easily brought down by those with malicious intentions. Since the birth of X-Road in 2001,
the system has operated continuously without interruption. The X-Road helps the state see the big picture of how different authorities are connected to one another. In addition, the X-Road makes it possible to exchange data not only within the country, but also across national borders. That is, of course, if databases and information systems are working properly. The biggest beneficiaries of the X-Road are, of course, the citizens. They enjoy the benefits of a better functioning state and save all of the time they would otherwise spend submitting papers and forms. How much time? Hmm? During the time it took you to watch this animation, the X-Road saved around 240 working hours in Estonia. Cool. Now, what this does, among other things, is that uh, in addition to giving you security, uh, we, uh, it changes the nature of bureaucracy uh, for the first time since it was invented 5,000 years ago, uh, either in Mesopotamia or China, uh, bureaucracy has always been a parallel, I mean, a serial process. If you have, especially when you, if you want a permission to do something, you apply with a piece of paper, the paper goes to one agency, then it goes to another agency, say, if you think about establishing a business, I mean, you have to check if you know, all the board members have paid their taxes, someone else has to check if they paid their alimony, someone else has to check if anyone's ever gone bankrupt. So it just takes <clears throat> quite a long time. This makes processing of bu uh, bureaucratic processing parallel. And in fact, which speeds things up from establishing a business in my country takes about 15 minutes because all of those, all of those queries are answered simultaneously. Um, the system also uh, allows for uh, greater transparency and reduction of corruption because basically decisions are made by, by checking the boxes rather than by having an official who uses his, uh, di his discretion to decide whether you get something that you are entitled to or not. I don't mean entitlements, but say, you know, if I want permission to dig a hole, I have to apply to my municipality. Uh, just to make sure that there's no water main down there or there's no uh, you know, electrical cable. Now, you know, in a lot of countries, uh, if you apply, then you, know, you should get the permission, but there's an official there saying, well, you, know, you get it if you, you know, get, slip me you know, five whatever it is that you, that you have to pay in whatever currency. Uh, these kinds of decisions are made automatically. The best result, however, this is we have applied a once-only rule which means that the government may not ask you for any information it already has. I mean, once you're identified, you no longer have to write your address down again, your telephone number, any of that stuff. But this is all, of course, done online. Um, and this system has now been adopted from us. We give it away as foreign aid um, by a number of countries. I mean, this platform is kind of foreign aid on a, on a thumb drive. Uh, Finland, uh, probably most prominently, we now are jointly uh, developing this. It's all open source, non-proprietary software. Um, Mexico is adopting it. Panama has taken it over. Uh, Moldova has had it for a while. Georgia kind of, um, I mean, countries vary in how much they do this. Uh, Oman, we gave it to the Palestinian Authority, but they never used it. Um, so it really depends. But again, what this does allow us uh, for in terms from, from the point of view of the citizen is go and do things that traditionally have not happened at all. We will, as the next year, have cross-border interoperability of digital prescriptions. So a Finn coming to S Estonia, if he gets, has too good a time, we get eight million Finns visiting a year, uh, loses medicine, uh, he can then uh, call or write his doctor in uh, north of the Arctic Circle. The doctor will then renew his prescription. He will take his Finnish ID, plug it into any pharmacy, put in his identifying numbers, and he will get his medicine. Uh, it took, I proposed this five years ago to the Finnish president. Next year will be six years since I proposed it. That's how long it takes. The technology would probably, as in most cases, take about three days to do uh, all of the this is my mantra is it's, it's, it's 
political will, policies, laws, and regulations, it's taken that long to go anywhere. Furthermore, on digital secu uh, and security, before I move on to the big picture, is um, we have, the, the big issue in Europe, has, has, especially since Snowden, has been privacy. And privacy, of course, is very important. Uh, I would argue this system allows far more privacy than, than um, the current system, but uh, it does require a certain degree of trust, uh, which is why we don't have backdoors, uh, because if we had backdoors, you wouldn't have trust, and then no one would use the system. Um, but the real issue, to my mind, has been, is, is really data integrity. I may not like it if someone publishes my bank account or my blood type. If someone changes my blood type, or the record of my blood type, or if someone changes my bank account number, or contents, that's a disaster. So what we have done is put uh, all uh, citizen data, cr critical citizen data, health records, um, property records, law cases, because now they're all digital, and we wouldn't want those changed. We put them all on blockchain. Um, it's a, uh, it's interesting enough, it's, since it's all the public sector, it's all on a private blockchain because if it's a public one, it'll take forever to work, uh, as with Bitcoin, but uh, it's on a private blockchain and administered by the government, um, which then uh, means that you can't change these data. The, uh, the other thing that we have done, which uh, for security in addition to all this, is that as, as a small nation, uh, that's been invaded about 20 times in the last thousand years. Uh, we do worry about our, <laughs> about our data. Um, or, I mean, we actually based on the experience of Japan, which lost about 5% of its uh, of data in the Fukushima incident, uh, we have now established a, a data embassy, of applying the Vienna Convention on Extraterritoriality of diplomatic representations, we have given our big server um, diplomatic status. It's in Luxembourg, there will be others, so that if we happen to have, I mean, we won't have any bad seismic events most likely because it's fairly calm. I mean, if I were Greece, I would certainly do something similar, right? I mean, not a, not a happy place for, for seismic events, but certainly you want to keep your data elsewhere. A non-issue for the United States, the U.S. is huge, you don't have to worry about, I mean, all you need are to keep your data in several different places, but for smaller countries, you probably do need to think about these things. Um, all right, I will, um, and the final thing and at the national level of what we do is that we have a prohibition of unupdated software. Uh, all you have to do is look at WannaCry, which took down <laughs> the UK's entire National Health Service because the UK, being too cheap, did not update. Uh, I mean, I guess the, the, the version of Windows they were using, I, uh, Microsoft uh, stopped updating in 2009. They made a special deal with the with my, UK and the, uh, Microsoft made a special deal to keep it up, I guess, to 2013, but even that lapsed. And then this spring, 2017, you had the WannaCry ransomware, which shut down the medical system of a big European country. Um, we can't, you can't allow that. This is, again, I think is a fundamental, um, a fundamental issue that needs to be dealt with both in the private and the public sector is that you cannot have legacy software. In other words, you must think of, uh, of software as a operating cost, a running cost. Most companies and most countries think of software as a, uh, as a capital investment, right? It's not like a car. It's not as if you bought a car two years ago, you don't need another one for three. Uh, you must always keep your software up to date. Or as in the Equifax case, when they were identified of a vulnerability in February, they didn't bother patching it uh, until after they were breached. Uh, 
I mean, this is no, these are things that if you're not going to get companies to, to observe that and if, uh, and if governments don't observe that, you're going to have to legislate this. Um, certainly in the case of Europe, the, um, the application of the, uh, of the new general data protection regulation will force U.S. companies, in, at least in Europe, to worry about uh, patching things or what happens to citizens data because the f the fine is going to be four percent of a company's revenue worldwide which is no small thing people may complain and moan about you know the regulations of uh, of the European Union <coughs> personally I think after Equifax uh, there's nothing you can say about that I mean it's um, I'm more surprised that there's been so little of a citizen outcry on all of this than, um, than there has been, uh, just as it <coughs> there is I'm surprised that all kinds of things such as what happens to data in this country or in a number of European countries and its use, for example, Cambridge Analytica's use of, of data it has bought in creating highly targeted um, highly granular uh, ads in the last election, probably also in the UK Brexit referendum. Um, I think that these are all issues that will need to be addressed. They're not, they're political issues, they're not there yet. All right, I will now like to move on just quickly to the, um, to the international part of this, which is that um, while I agree with Joe on, on the need for, for conventions, um, there's only one convention that works at this point, and that's the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. Uh, originally, it was the Council of Europe, uh, Council of Europe uh, Convention, uh, which was then acceded to by uh, liberal democracies. I mean, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Japan, Australia. They, uh, then they decided to call it the Budapest Convention because it was no longer a Council of Europe thing. Um, the problem with that convention, but which may also lead the way to future thinking, is that there are a whole host of countries that have not acceded to the Budapest Convention, most prominently China, Russia, and Belarus. Uh, I don't know, I think Ukraine is somewhere in between, because Ukraine until, at least during, uh, up till the end of the Yanukovych regime, was also a primary source of all kind of cyber crime. But rather, I direct attention to a fundamental conundrum of cybersecurity at the international level that we need to address, which is that our thinking about security since the first rock by a hominid, pre-human hominid, was thrown to kill another pre-human hominid, hominid has been kinetic distance-based, force equals mass times acceleration, meters per second squared. Meters no longer matter in security these days. Distance does not matter. All of our security thinking up till the present has been based on the concept of distance, therefore geography, I mean, think about what, what, is our, what is the primary security organization that we have. I mean, if, you're, if we who are in it, but it's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Countries that share all of the values of the countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, such as New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Uruguay, I don't know, you can name a whole bunch. They are not in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, simply because they're not in the North Atlantic. And uh, all the work of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization uh, is based on things such as you know, tank logistics, uh, fighter range, bomber range, uh, troop movement logistics. It's all distance-based. Today, none of this is, I mean, today, all of these threats have nothing to do with distance. Borders are breached without being noticed. On top of that, the threats the threats uh, will take just one, APT-28, Fancy Bear, I mean, various names have <coughs> been given to it. What have they done? They've hacked the Bundestag. They've hacked the Italian Foreign Ministry. Um, they've 
done all kinds of things in the Netherlands, Sweden, Ukraine, uh, even the world, uh, world uh, anti-doping agency has been hacked by, uh, by AP, this one group of uh, probably GRU hackers. Uh, it, of course, did hack the DNC. I should point out here that, uh, uh, that David Langer, at least, told me that of the 126 people working at the DNC with access to the DNC server, 124 were actually using two-factor authentication. Two were not. Guess how the DNC server got hacked. Anyway, uh, the point is that you, that our ways of looking at things in the, sci in the digital era just have to change. Uh, that we have to think about security not in terms of geography. We have to realize that the threats uh, can hit all over um, and that perhaps what is at risk are, are uh, forms of government, ways of, have, of organizing society. Uh, certainly that's the case what we've seen, that is the case we've seen in the last year or so um, with uh, not only with attempts to de derail the U.S. election, but we s now know better that with the Brexit, uh, uh, with the Brexit campaign, we know that uh, in France, uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, server was hacked. Um, the French were, having learned from the DNC, were smart. They actually loaded their, ser their email server with obvious fakes uh, so that when they were doxxed, uh, the, the doxxers uh, published things that were so obviously fake that it, it disqualified virtually everything, even what was perhaps potentially embarrassing. Nonetheless, I would say that we do have to I mean, while these individual actions might, um, I mean, well, we, should, we should learn from these individual actions and think about how we should guarantee our security in the future. Um, and think about working together a lot more. Um, our own experience with this was not very good. In 2007, we had, uh, I mean, I guess from now on every history of cyber warfare will begin with the April-May 2007 attacks on Estonia. They were DDoS attacks, which uh, so that meant our systems were never breached. They were just shut off from people. Uh, at the time, uh, NATO was loath to admit that this had been going on. Uh, slowly, people came around and realized that's, uh, that this was a uh, this was a Clausewitzian event of a continuation of policy by other means, uh, and it ultimately what we had been asking for for years, which was a center of excellence in Tallinn, which produced the Tallinn Manual 1 and 2, uh, was established in my country. But NATO, even NATO took a while to get there, so uh, sort of tr the traditional model of, you know, someone breaches the border, and then there's, then you, there's an Article 5 uh, decision made at the NAC uh, doesn't really hold uh, because in a cyber event you don't you don't you have problems with attribution uh, you don't know what the proper response is uh, we're just not ready for that or have not been ready for that um, but nonetheless we see the the security situation has decreased to such a level that even our de democratic systems are seem to be under threat. Um, that we have to start thinking in multilateral terms. As I mentioned, we do have the, um, we do have the uh, Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, which kind of maybe leads, the, leads gives us an idea that like-minded nations have agreed that they will, uh, will work uh, against cybercrime, will give out criminals from their territory. It's been used to great effect in a number of countries where where, say, one country identifies a hacker in another country, and follow, according to the Budapest Convention, they are then extradited. Um, we see that um, other areas don't work so well. As uh, Joe mentioned, UNGA 
has failed um, this year. Uh, that's because, well, even during, I mean, the ITU discussions about five years ago, already then, uh, a set of like-minded countries, uh, China, Belarus, Russia, uh, as it were, uh, were uh, basically arguing for what would amount to censorship of the web, because their definition of security is, of information security, is not devoted to hacking, is not restricted something to hacking other people's infrastructure, it includes freedom of speech. And that's clearly something that uh, liberal democracies are not willing to put up with. So, what uh, I mean, another example of fairly successful cooperation that also might lead the way is, that, is precisely the NATO Center uh, in Tallinn, because while it was originally open only to NATO countries, it is now open to other like-minded nations. Finland, a, an avowedly non-NATO member, um, has, uh, is a member. Japan is basically has asked us, you know, what, how we, could we join? We said fine. I mean, it's a it's a long decision making process there. But if we are, as we have seen, with uh, threatened both at the, I mean at the level of infrastructure, at the level of privacy, at the level of of our democratic processes, we will have to develop at least among liberal democracies some kind of. Uh, some kind of defensive mechanisms, among them the, um, uh, among them international cooperation. At this point, or until perhaps, until about two weeks ago, um, there was no real, has been no real cooperation within NATO. I mean, this, NATO idea of cybersecurity is only to deal with the security of the organization not the members or the allies, but just the organization. Thinking is moving beyond that, but maybe it's not gone far enough. I do think that with, um, we will have to face up to the reality that liberal democracies are under threat, that the mechanisms for attacking liberal democracies are no longer merely kinetic, and that we have to start working toward some kind of serious uh, organization for cybersecurity, for liberal democracies that, as with the attacks, transcend geographical boundaries so that from New Zealand and Australia to Finland and Estonia, uh, countries will share information. It's going to be a long time. Cyber information, in, even within NATO, as I said, is more a matter of, it follows the espionage paradigm where you don't share anything as opposed to the interoperability paradigm of you put a, you know, a U.S. missile under a French Mirage jet. I mean, in that sense of interoperability. Uh, in fact, it's, I mean, one of our experiences when we discovered some malware, we went to NATO and said, oh, look what we found, and NATO said, oh, you too, um, to an ally. That's not how you do cybersecurity, uh, frankly. So I would argue and close with that we do need, well, not quite close, we do need to think about these things, but I will close with two small points. One of them is that um, we hear everywhere all this talk about we need back doors. We've seen the Prime Minister of Australia, the, minister, the uh, Commissioner of Justice for the European Union, the Minister of home uh, affairs in the UK, the US Attorney General also argue for back doors. I don't understand that issue, frankly, why you would want to do that. Um, or maybe because it comes from not understanding technology. Basically, as soon as you have a back door, that becomes the holy grail. The holy grail for the people, because it's one-stop shopping. Why would you want to try to hack anyone if there is a hackable, and I use the term broadly, hackable key, a back door somewhere? And we need not think only in terms of smart people hacking a key, as, um, you know, which, which they, smart people, have done, and we know CIA and NSA have been hacked. But you don't even need that. I mean, the worst cases of 
of breaches have been insider threats. I mean, Scott Sagan just put out a really, I mean, a whole collection of insider threats. But if you think about it, what's, what are the worst cases? I mean, Snowden. That was not, and no one breached NSA. He was an insider threat. Reality winner, that bizarrely named woman who just uh, uh, sort of I mean, gave out an NSA document on Russian attempts to hack voting machines. Uh, again, insider, an insider job. Now, if I, if I if just take, not to criticize the United States, I'll just say I'm, I mean, I, in the European Union, 500 million people, the commissioner for, uh, for justice says, okay, it gets her wish, and the wish is to have a backdoor key. Now, if I'm Vladimir Putin uh, or someone else, I mean, I would say, okay, I don't have to hack anything. I just need the key. I can get into everything, everything. Uh, and instead of, instead of trying to get in there through digital electronic means, I would just find out who the key master is and say, I give you two billion, two billion euros. I mean, eventually you find someone who's going to fall for that. Um, so let's stay away from backdoor keys is um, my point. <laughs> In this regard, I should say that Estonia, which the ITU, that nefarious organization, has listed Estonia as the most secure, most secure in terms of cybersecurity country in Europe. Um, Russia is the most secure in Eurasia. China is the most secure in Asia. The only difference is that the, um, the Freedom House is also rated Estonia as number one in the world in Freedom Online, which which disputes, I say, or, or the argument that you need to be uh, repressive in order to have security in cyberspace. But I th ultimately, everything boils down, to my mind, to a brilliant essay that needs, well, it wasn't that brilliant, but the ideas in it were brilliant, uh, that, uh, that was written 68 years ago, um, 1959. 62 years ago, I don't know, I'm, I'm tired, jet lag. By C.P. Snow called The Two Cultures, uh, which I think was not nearly as relevant when it was published as it is today. Uh, C.P. Snow was a physical chemist and a literary novelist who gave the world the term the corridors of power in one of his novels. Uh, but he has this great little essay as you said, not so great essay, but <laughs> here's his essay about be, being at the faculty dining club in his college in Cambridge, sitting with the, uh, the quantum, or sitting with the physical chemists, the physicists, the other chemists, discussing presumably quantum mechanics. And then he would get up after dinner and go drink with the, with the poets and the essayists and the novelists and the Shakespeare scholars. And he says that you can't, I mean, he was the only one who could move between the two tables. The poets and essayists had no clue about physics, and the physicists and the chemists couldn't care less about literature. And he said this is a problem of the university. I would argue that today it's a problem of society. Because back then, technology did not impinge upon people's lives the way it does now. Uh, your phone, did not tell anyone where you were. You could, uh, it was plugged into the wall. Um, the most you had to do, uh, your greatest, your television could not look at you, so despite, you know, sort of Orwell being published already 10 years earlier, but, you know, you're, you didn't need to put a little thing in front of your computer to keep uh, the computer from looking at you or listening to you. Uh, the most you interact with technology, perhaps, was to set the timing on your distributor cap, which is something that most people under 40 don't even know what it is. So it was a different world. Today, technology impinges upon us everywhere. Yet people do not understand uh, the problem. The technologists do not understand the ethical, legal, moral, philosophical basis of a liberal democracy in many cases. And the people who are responsible for the legal system do not have a clue about IT. Uh, on the one hand, uh, right after the uh, iPhone came out, like it was one of the early apps, you could find out where you traveled. 
So I downloaded the app and I got this map of you know where I'd been, all based on the S7 protocol that says where you know the mobile phone has been. You know, the big fat lines where I traveled a lot, and and thinner gray ones where I didn't. I showed it to uh, I had security detail. I showed it to them. They said. They got white and they said, eliminate that immediately. I said, what's the point? I mean, the data exists, right? Someone else can have it. Um, and then again, in, 19, in 2014, in the fall, I went to, uh, I went to the European Parliament. It was a, they have a five-year term. It was half a year after their most recent election. I gave a talk about digital stuff, tell, trying to tell them how important it is that you actually know something about it. And as a kind of you know, show and tell moment, I pulled out my mobile phone. I said, you know, this thing here, you all have one. Everyone had one, of course. 